very little seems actually to be known about the mysticism of the Near East. Man exploring into the great religious and philosophic systems of the world has more or less ignored the vast areas of desert that divide Europe from the Far East. We have a suspicion that long ago great cultures flourished in this area. And we know that legends and traditions have come down that make this wild and desolate region one of the most fascinating, mysterious places on earth. The people who live in this area are to us also rather incomprehensible. Of all the world religions, we have had the most difficulty here in the West trying to really understand the faith of Islam. There are many students of other Oriental beliefs, but very few of our background who have given much real thought or attention to the religions and faiths of the deserts of the Near East or North Africa. The few who have entered this area and become impregnated with its subtle force and power have held the Muslim in high esteem. They have found him to be a wonderfully integrated human being, reliant upon the inner resources of himself, a true friend, a deep and sympathetic companion, but at the same time a fierce enemy. The virtues and vices of the desert have belonged to these people from time immemorial. By their very psychic integration, their philosophy of life has been associated with sand and rock and palm trees, caravan routes, oases, and the slender fingers of the towers of mosques rising from the desert. It has all been part of their way of life. Yet when we uh, come closer to them, we are amazed at the childlike cheerfulness of these people. They are strangely and deeply sophisticated and at the same time utterly naive. Very simple things bring them great joy. Curious superstitions that we can scarcely comprehend still regulate much of their conduct. We learn of them by degrees, by a process of acceptances in which they have to accept us. So there are some from the West who have mingled their destinies with those of the Near East and have found something they could never find here, a sincerity of life almost unknown to us. I rather suspect from talking with Muslims in various walks of life including the priests of some of the greater temples and shrines, mosques, uh, that the Muslim is in much our, in our condition as far as his religion is concerned. He does not know too much about it himself. He holds the Koran sacred. The name of the prophet is the highest and most important basis of bond and oath and obligation. He knows that somewhere in the history of his faith there was a dividing of the paths. Not only did he develop a strong doctrinal structure, 
but he also developed strange, mysterious beliefs. Some of these beliefs undoubtedly came to him from Greece, along with the wisdom that he was later to save for Europe. He became learned in the wisdom of Plato and Aristotle. He read Homer when they were unknown, or when these writings were unknown in Europe. He advanced many lines of science, and during what we call the Dark Ages, he was the custodian of nearly all the knowledge of Western civilization. Later, when religious persecution became very oppressive in Europe, when education was frustrated by the powers of princes and clergies, scholars, doctors, lawyers, artists, musicians, poets, all sought refuge in the Near East and many of the most brilliant minds of their times are gathered in the courts of Baghdad and other great centers where they found a free atmosphere of learning. As late as the 15th century, European doctors went to the Muslim colleges where only in these colleges could they find truly scientific instruction. The Crusades gave us a new insight into the Muslim nature, particularly the chivalry and dignity of the Sarasan. We began to appreciate the great empires of the desert and the glittering court of the great Near Eastern rulers like Saladin the Magnificent. All of this, however, was but the surface of our consideration. What were the forces moving under the spiritual surface of these areas? How did these mystical groups come into being? We have suggested that perhaps they gained something from the Orphic rites of Greece. Perhaps something else from the surviving Osirian rituals of Egypt. There is no doubt in my mind that they also drank in the fountains of Far Eastern wisdom. In some way along those caravan routes, perhaps those same routes that had previously been followed by the armies of Alexander of Macedonia, there was a stream of cultural exchange the Silk Road, connecting China with the Mediterranean, the caravan routes, where there was a continuous circulation of news, of culture, of beliefs, of opinions, of trades, of merchandise, of arts and crafts. There is much to make it possible for us to feel without exaggeration. But prior to the rise of the great Othman Wall, there was a rather free circulation of thought between Asia and the Mediterranean. And along this mysterious path, much wisdom probably flowed from India, even China, into the deserts of the Near East. Of this wisdom, Two or three schools seem to have left a marked impression. One was the yogic school of India. Another, perhaps, the material that was later to be integrated into the cult of Vedanta. There was also, almost certainly, a fusion with Buddhism. And although later... Islam seemed to be particularly opposed to Buddhist thinking, particularly in India. Perhaps it was opposed to something that it, in a subtle or subconscious way, almost feared. In any event, in the Near East, orthodoxy, the uh, rather strict code of the prophet, with its regulations almost mosaic in their rigid enforcements, 
this doctrine was not completely satisfactory to the people, to the men of the desert. As one of them is supposed to have said, referring to the situation, in all these doctrines there is too much thunder and too little rain. Uh, it, was, uh, it was without anything to make fruitful the part sand of dryness. And we are all rather well acquainted with what happens when doctrines become dry, as most of them finally do. In the Near Eastern mystic, we probably therefore do find something of what India called the doctrine of the void. This voidness plays a, a rather prominent part in the pessimism of Omar Khayyam. The doctrine of the void was a strange, sad, at the same time, uh, almost happy sense of utter and complete futility. It had something to do with the idea of fatalism that dominated the Near East for a long time and even still has a large part in its psychology. This fatalism, kismet, may not be far from the Indic karma. But whatever it is that was under it all, the Near Eastern had a streak of nostalgia in him that was very broad and deep. He lived in a world that was rather cruel, a world of dryness and hunger and death. And yet this strange world, like the desert, is probably one of the most beautiful regions on the earth. Beautiful for everything except man. Man can admire it, man can adore it, but it turns upon him and destroys him. It is a garden suited to the gods, but hardly suitable for human beings. The great expanses of the desert, the wonders of the sunrise and the sunset, the sky, the stars, the endless shifting hills of sand blown by the wind, all these elements and factors got into the soul of the Near East. They became part of it. They became part of its great symbolism, of its patterned existence. If we try to understand, for example, the mysticism of the dervishes or the Sufi, we seem to come to something that is very interesting. It isn't clearly stated in their writings, very little is clearly stated. But it seems to be there. And this thought is that the world in which we live, our region, with its own man-made wonders, is divided from another world by an interval so slight, so incredibly tenuous, uh, that it is hard to even comprehend it. There is another region, another dimension of existence that seems to flow in and out of physical things. Uh, this dimension is no further away from our objective life than the hour of prayer in the desert. It is something that in sleep and dream comes into our objective awareness. We can almost reach out our hands and touch another dimension of existence. I think this perhaps also belongs to the desert. It belongs to the strange silences of the night. It belongs to a people whose life has strangely turned in upon itself. A life of one alone in the midst of an infinity. And yet this one standing alone, conquering infinity, merely by a mood, by an emotion, by a simple gesture, a breath. This infinity around man had all kinds of dimensions and proportions to the Easterner. 
Dhammakayam, existence itself, was a strange symbolic utility. If we are to accept literally uh, the words of his poems, to him as to the followers of the doctrine of the void, uh, nothing is really very important at all. We come like the rain and like the wind we go. The flower that once was blown forever dies. Everything is surrounded by this strange barrier through which life apparently cannot pass. And yet so near to this mysterious barrier is something else which sort of divides the Eastern psychology between hope and hopelessness, between an infinite longing for a great faith and the eternal frustration of obvious things seen with the eyes and touched with the physical hands. So, in the dervishes and in the Sufis, I think there is a very valid uh, concept that we should give more attention to. We can find much of it set forth in the beautiful poems of Jalaluddin and in others of this group. Let us imagine for a moment that sometime long ago these mystics discovered the secret of internalization of vision. They realized that at any time they could live in any world they wanted to live in. But they never forgot for a moment that they were creating all these strange changing worlds in which they existed. Perhaps like the Amidist among the Buddhists, they were able to envision all the splendors of Amitabha's paradise and yet at the same time soberly realize that they had created this paradise themselves. So the two ways of life for these people were very clearly demarked. Man can either create a beautiful world or a terrible one. He can live his span of years reaching out his finger toward an intangible sublimity or he can sort of say rot out his years with no faith in anything, no hope. Or perhaps even more dangerously he could struggle out his years hating, fighting, cursing the very existence which had fashioned him. Each of these decisions arose within man himself. They were his own devisements. And if some of this teaching came from the Far East, as it quite possible, uh, the Sufi may have also sensed that there was a way in which perhaps the dream world uh, could be brought even closer to our material existence. Perhaps sometime, some way, the dream and the reality might be reversed. Our present sad way of life would then become the dream, and our hope would become the solid substance. Certainly this mysterious interchange of worlds was part of the experience of the mystics of Islam. Perhaps we can go a little further in this and uh, imagine, as we find in some of the old legends, the Muslim mystic facing the strange mirage, not created now by some illusion in the atmosphere, but a mirage fashioned from the subtle substances of his own desiring. There are legends, we find them in the Arabian Nights Entertainment and other works of these peoples, that the lonely traveler, standing looking out at the desert, suddenly saw it transform before his eyes. Where there had been only sand and rock, there now rose the minarets of a great mosque. A teeming city seemed to rise from the sand, and even with his mortal ears, he could hear the camel bells of the phantom city. 
and from the steps of the great mosque there streamed out the strange masters of mysteries in their green robes the saints of Islam and the mysterious beings who lived only in this strange atmosphere of mirage and wonder in the desert therefore almost anywhere could rise a paradise a paradise as strange and wonderful as that sensed by the orthodox Muslim as the reward for mortal virtue or a paradise as strange and fantastic as that created by the hashish dreams of the assassins somehow there was this great question however was the mirage real was this phantom city actually out there somewhere was there only some very slight vibration in the atmosphere some mysterious door of molecules and atoms which could open the man would find that he was always living in the suburbs of paradise certainly these mystics began to contemplate bringing these dreams closer to the facts of things whether they really knew how these mysterious sites were fashioned we are not sure perhaps even if we thought we were sure we would still not know for in our way of thinking dreams are not real but perhaps actually they are more real than the waking circumstances we have come to accept so out of this strange sensing of a better world moving around within and through the present one uh, the Muslim mystic seemed to sense that paradise interpenetrated his desert land it was not a place far removed in some remote corner of the earth it was there with him in the desert and the very sands upon which he walked washed the shores of heaven it was a very interesting strange perhaps deeply psychological situation but out of it arose a series of rather tangible and important consequences the uh, Muslim mystic created for himself in this strange way a world of incredible beauty a world in which every wonderful lovely fantastic thing had a real substance a world in many ways an extremely sensual world and in other ways strangely spiritual and unbelievable for in this world are all the wonders of Muhammad's paradise but also here walk the gray bearded sages who have been upon the earth since the beginning of time here the mysterious saints of the dervishes who had retired from the world could commune with their disciples they could walk down the mysterious bridge of air and moonbeams and appear in the desert to comfort the needy or enlighten the truth seeker everywhere man dwelt he was on the very steps of a mother somewhere where the various hopes and dreams and aspirations and fulfillments of all things all these were possible and the next step could only be the continuation of the first the instinct of the individual to transfer a center of consciousness from the painful mortal sphere to the rapturous regions of his heart's desire here he came nearer and nearer into the mystery of yoga here he began to recognize what the European masters of magic used to call the mystery of the astral light he discovered that he could actually restore paradise within himself that he could find within his own nature a universe unsuspected in the normal states of mundane things just as a man in a dream can dream of himself wandering across the whole face of the earth 
is dreamed vast enough to include within itself great ranges of mountains, great expanses of seas, incredible distances of space and time, yet all these existing within himself. So perhaps there was a way of moving into the dream. Perhaps man could pass through the mysterious looking glass, like Alice in Wonderland, and find uh, that this strange region that seemed as though he had fashioned it was not really fashioned by him at all, but only discovered, and that he, it was a legitimate expanse of magnificence, that he could, under certain conditions, step across from the finite into the infinite without the mystery of death, that he could find inwardly in his meditations the road that led to the mysterious shining mosques in the air where the saints dwelt forever, adoring the eternal God. As a result of this type of thinking, the Muslim began to use his own nature as a strange symbol. He transformed every worldly thing into a symbolic equivalent. He no longer regarded uh, words as having the common traditional meanings with which we are acquainted. He gave them rich poetic license of their own. He used them in special ways, creating a, a vocabulary of mysticism. He was not alone in this. Nearly all other nations did the same thing. That is why the language of the poets will always be incomprehensible to those who have no poetry in their hearts. In any event, the mystic began uh, to, to think of all material things as in some way the lengthening shadow of this mystic universe of realities. All mortal joys were but shadows of eternal joy. All earthly wisdom but the faint shadow of eternal wisdom. Everything in this world was only a likeness, a mask, a ghost of some reality that existed only in the invisible natures of things. Man himself was an appearance. And behind this appearance with which we are all familiar was a mystery that no one has ever solved. We think we know the man. We shake his hand. We do business with him. We share the road with him, but we never know him. Everywhere the inner parts of things are hidden. And the uh, Muslim had to decide in his own way one of two uh, points. First of all, when he looked into this man's face, was there a being behind this face? Was there a mystery there at all? Or was this face all of the man? Was it merely a mask animated? Was there really nothing behind that face other than the commonplace with which we are most generally familiar? Was this face the real person? Would it grow old and die? And when it died, when the face died, would the man no longer exist? Some took this rather pessimistic point of view. But even in these cases, there is doubt as to their real intention. But to the others, the more idealistically contriving, this face was like the mask worn by an actor. Behind the limited expressions that move the features of man's face was a mysterious luminance, the real face. As the poet said, we could only see it a little bit, shining through the eyes. These eyes that could blaze with hate, these eyes that could turn to the eternal gentleness of love. Something was behind the mask, but only on rare occasions did this something escape enough for us to really sense its meaning. So little by little, our Persian mystics took the whole world to be a face, a mask, a persona. This face was enough for those who had no other hopes or fears. 
perhaps the space itself could be lifted sometime to Mohammed's paradise. Perhaps his face would still be counted among the faithful. Or it was even more likely that this face would vanish away, but that the being behind the face would not cease that this being in some way could no longer be visually comprehended, that the death was merely tearing away the face we see, leaving the being we have never seen, that we will never really be able to see. Uh, this, in turn, uh, led the Muslim mystic to all kinds of strange exaggerations about the mysteries that were taking place behind the mask. Whether it was the mask of the masked prophet, or whether it was simply the mask of the newborn babe, what was behind it? What did it mean? What kind of a world did man really live in? Did he live in three dimensions, or did he live in fifty dimensions, without realizing the extent of his own consciousness? Was there within himself a mysterious power that could break through all of these appearances, and reveal to him this land forever impinging upon mortality. Was it true that Muhammad's paradise interpenetrated every grain of desert sand? That even in the actual words of the Quran itself, every man gazing into the sunrise gazed into the face of Allah? What was this mystery? Was everything merely the shining light of God, which we did not know how to understand? Were we looking out and saying these are rivers and mountains and palm trees and cities, when in reality we were looking into the face of God? All the interpretations, all the explanations, depended upon the mood of the men of the desert, the world in which they lived, the loneliness in which they were born and died. I think, however, uh, in this searching, the dervishes and the Sufis, and to a measure also the Druzes of the Lebanon, came finally to the conclusion that the thing that divided the world we see, the mask, from the reality which we do not see, was a moment of the suspension of breath true that the heart ceases, men die. And in that simple instant of the stopping of a heart, a world ends. A kind of existence ceases forever. Perhaps also in the simple moment of the inhaling of a breath, man can move from one world to another. In some mysterious way, it is possible in the dimensions of mysticism uh, to open up this strange internal existence so that it becomes more real than the world around us. The Sufis and to my measure the dervishes also, in some of their orders at least, determined upon a way of internal discipline they followed, in a sense, the disciplines of yoga. They followed also the mysterious secrets of the uh, Chinese uh, philosophers of the void. These individuals who said that the way to this other reality was to step for a second through non-existence. To step through the void the mysterious emptiness of the Huayam, and then, in that instant, to come into that which is reality. To the Sufis, this stepping into the void, this stepping from all condition or any condition to the suspension of any and all condition, was through meditation, was especially through the supreme cultivation of cosmic silence. Not just the silence of a man in prayer, not just the silence of a mother listening 
for the cry of a sick babe. Not this silence which is merely the temporary suspension of our worldliness. Not in the silence of the night alone, but in a strange, deep quietness that can be discovered within the self. For it was firmly believed by many of these people uh, that if you listened in the absolute silence, you could hear the tinkle of the caravan bells of the souls moving through space from existence to existence. Uh, this silence, then, was man's mysterious hope of being able to slip out of the mortal illusion into the immortal reality. Silence was a rather strange thing, and in spite of his natural uh, existence in a world that was largely silent, or perhaps because he lived in this kind of a world, the Muslim mystic was a little afraid of it. He feared this very silence that he wanted to cultivate. He was afraid, perhaps, that this silence was extinction. Just as Western man is afraid of quietude, because to him it seems a passivity which will cut him off from all the accomplishments of his kind. The Easterner, who had lived in silence, became a little afraid of it, and yet he sensed deeply that it was the path that he had to follow if he wished to achieve his ends. So there were several ways in which this silence could be attained. And among many of the Near Eastern mystics, as in the case of Jalaluddin Rumi, this path to silence was the path of a strange internal ecstasy. It was the individual possessed by that which was not himself. Like the Indian and the Buddhist mystic, the Muslim uh, Sufi was desperately afraid of this strange fascination of selfness. He knew in some mysterious way that he could never escape from the desert and its loneliness and the heat and the sun and the arid land unless he could defeat the instinct of selfness within himself. He had to escape from the hypnosis of his own purposes. As long as he was totally self-centered, as long as his every thought was upon himself, upon his own achievements, upon the numerous possible accomplishments which distinguished even the life of the desert, a self-accomplishment that could lead to pride and fortune and involvement and attachment, unless there was some way out of this, he could never step across and escape from the face which he saw in his mirror. This face was the image of a selfness, and behind it was something else, and he could only discover it by breaking through the hypnosis of his own self-existence. So in the uh, Muslim uh, concept of this, we have this tremendous emotional unselfness. We have the individual striving desperately to be lost in something else. Perhaps if he could be totally lost in the desert, he would find that part of his nature which was hidden from him by the commonplace. Perhaps if he could be totally lost in self-sacrifice, he would define his life by losing it. Perhaps if he was completely lost in his adoration of the Beloved, he would find in this complete self-abnegation the kind of love that would bring him close to God. In any event, there had to be this escape from the, uh, the tremendously personal. There had to be this strange experience of being picked up and carried completely away from self. 
so that self was no longer important. He looked around him and he tried to find symbols of this escape. He found it in the mother, willing to die for her ailing babe, willing to sacrifice her own life to protect the life of the little one. He found it also in the patriot, willing to die for his country or his honor, or the preservation of his way of life, even though this way of life was so strange and tiresome and barren. He found this also in great human affections, the sacrifices human beings make simply because they love. And because of this love, I wish he are willing to die at any moment for the protection of that which they do love. Wherever there is great unselfishness, there is great good. Wherever there is selfishness, there is great evil. Wherever there is worldliness, there is selfishness. And the only way to break through this mystery, this mask of existence, is to find some way of forgetting self, of leaving self far behind in the service of something greater. To the orthodox Muslim, uh, this self-forgetfulness was in dedication to the teachings of the Prophet, willingness to die at any moment for Islam and the Holy Quran. But to the mystic there was much more than this. There was this need for eternal forgetfulness, because to remember self is pain. Not to remember self is to open the heart to joy. So joy comes in giving, not in gaining. The joy comes in forgetting, not in remembering. Joy comes in laying down one's life and not in picking up that life again. Out of all of this thinking came uh, a wonderful symbolism of ideas. A, a symbolism of mystic thoughts and speculations, visions, and hopes. And little by little, uh, the man's inner life came to be associated with the most common symbol of the men of the desert. That symbol was the prayer rug. The mat that was laid down five times a day while the pious Muslim knelt upon his rug of prayer faced Mecca and chanted the prayer of his faith. Now, this prayer rug was a magic carpet. It is the magic carpet of the Arabian Nights because in a way it is a tile lodge like a mason's lodge. This carpet is the boundary of a mysterious world of ritual, symbolism, and internal insight. To be kneeling upon your prayer rug means to separate yourself totally from all the mortal affairs of human existence. Uh, to be enveloped, so to say, in holiness. For wherever this rug is, this is the eternal temple. This is the mosque and the shrine. And as a man enters his church to pray, so the Muslim kneels upon his rug. And wherever this rug is, this is sanctuary. And in his prayers and meditations, the mystics, seated upon the mysterious symbolic rugs of their own detachments, were carried from one region to another as though truly by a genie, with strange powers and enchantments. Uh, these journeys into other dimensions and regions upon a flying carpet were all symbols of man's own inner ability to transcend the dimensions of space and time by meditation alone. Then came the problem that was very close to these people, for they were Muslims and they were devout in their own way, although perhaps not quite orthodox, and never entirely safe from the possible displeasure of the more conservative believers. Uh, this uh, problem of the experience of God. 
Muhammad had given them the concept of a great universal monotheistic divine power. And this power they had already sensed as the Christian sensed it. Not as something infinitely remote, but as something wonderfully immediate. That by some mysterious way, God was present, walking with man in the desert. That the power of God enveloped the human being at all times. That the wisdom and truth of God was available to him in every emergency of life and the mysterious angelic messengers of the great power. Like the wonderful angel Jaboriel was not ever far uh, from those who sought the way of truth. Uh, this uh, problem of the presence of God in the desert also had its effect upon these people. But they had to uh, more or less emotionalize this effect. They had to experience God as a friend, as someone of their own tribe, as someone extremely near to them, aware of their strengths and their weaknesses, no longer a great judge fashioning the world, no longer a vast power meeting out justice and retribution, but rather something uh, extremely tender, very near and immediate, the kind of God whose love melted the hearts of men so that all men turned to their father as a small child to its parent, not fully realizing the splendor of God, but knowing God only as strength, as hope, as protection, as constant enveloping personal love. The men of the desert struggled to understand this and it became a very important part of their religious experience. Uh, something that was to affect their literature and their art and their poetry. Now the likeness of God was not supposed to be fashioned by men. No more than was the face of the prophet ever to be unveiled in art. But even though these faces and features were hidden, uh, men sensed the powers of these things as extremely intimate, uh, as uh, always available by a mood, by a mysterious attitude. And so the Muslim began to develop a science of moods. He found that he could feel things that he wanted to feel, that it was per perfectly possible for him to create within himself a mood of receptivity. Uh, that he could have within himself the mood of the great, quiet love of God, the great, quiet peace of spirit that caused him to forget his own existence and to be one again with the strange remoteness of space. Uh, it was all very uh, strange and wonderful, but not so strange in the desert. Our American Indian uh, priests of the Southwest had these same moods because they too were people of the desert. And this was much, uh, had much to do with the fashioning of the mysticism of Islam. As it gradually developed into a great poetic system of experiences, uh, the mystic developed an ever greater sensitivity an ecstasy almost. And in the dervishes particularly, this ecstasy was one of the keys uh, to their entire attitude toward life. Christian mystics have also passed through the same experience. And uh, particularly Dante, who it is said could not look upon a rose without passing into a strange trance-like hysteria. Uh, the the concept of great beauty suddenly picked these persons up and threw them into a kind of ecstatic trance. They could not listen to the words of great truth without, as they said, fainting in the spirit, without suddenly finding themselves whipped into a strange semi-unconsciousness, something so beautiful, something so wonderful, 
that human existence melted in its presence and disappeared. We have, to a certain measure, had some such experiences even in our Western culture. If we stand in the presence of a great painting, a truly magnificent work of art, we are often moved deeply by what we've seen. To stand in the Sistine Chapel in Rome and to look upon the great scene of the Last Judgment is to be moved deeply. But in this case, we are moved to a strange awe. And this was not exactly the type of thing that the Moslem was interested in. It was not so much that he be awestruck as it was that he have a strange emotional kind of crisis within his consciousness. Uh, perhaps we come nearer to it in the beautiful little chapel of the Saint Chapelle in Paris. Here in a tulip-shaped uh, chapel entirely of stained glass, not of great size, but of perfectly sublime proportion in the presence of a diffused light that shines down from an absolute symmetry to cast all its rays upon the altar beneath which is hidden the wreath of thorns. In this, perhaps, we come a little nearer to the, uh, to the ecstasy of the Muslim. Here is something so exquisitely beautiful that we seem to pass into tears in the presence of it. We are so happy we cry. Uh, we are moved so deeply that we may pass through tears to an almost stony silence. We are past the common reactions. We find this also sometimes in great joy or grief. In great loss, we may have an outburst of emotion. Or we may remain strangely silent, unable to express numb with the tragedy of it all. But in the presence of the Saint Chapeau, we are strangely overwhelmed, fainting under the impact of incredible sublimity. To the Muslim, this mystical impact was of sublimity. It was something that simply swept him away from himself utterly. He seemed to pass into a strange unconsciousness, it was all so wonderful, so beautiful, so sacred, that his senses reeled under the impact, and he passed into a strange state of unknowing, an unknowing which was beautiful in itself, and from which he came back later into knowing regretfully, as though indeed he had been in paradise and was now forced back into the common estate of men. In the Islamic mysteries, the rose, as we find it in the great rose of Damascus, was one of the symbols. And we are assured from the old writings that from this rose of the dervishes and the Sufis came the sacred rose of the troubadours in Europe. This mysterious order, this priesthood of poets and singers who sang the strange, sad story of man's hopeless love a strange forever seeking after the virgin of the world who could never be actually attained. This mysterious virgin, the Virgin Sophia of the ancient Gnosis. Also this rose became associated with the rose of the Rosicrucians and other secret societies. Where it is said the founder of that organization had gone to Damkar in Arabia, and there he had been initiated into the mysteries of the, of the dervishes, the Druzes, and the Sufis. In any event, the rose, like Dante's mysterious rose of the Paradiso, became the great symbol of this explosion of consciousness. It was also the symbol of, used much like the lotus in India, for as the thousand petal lotus of Hindu uh, yoga uh, represented the tremendous release of cosmic consciousness in the human brain, so in the uh, mysteries of the Near East, this rose was the sudden unfolding of the experience of universality. And the very rose itself, being a Kabbalah on the word eros, 
the letters merely being rearranged, became an also the symbol of love. So in the Dervish and Sufi mysteries, love came to be far more than a human emotion. Uh, this thought undoubtedly dominated the thinking of Dante also, who fashioned out of the imagery of divine love the symbol of his Beatrice. Uh, this uh, uh, divine love uh, was human love directed toward eternity. It was human love sublimated infinitely and dedicated to the service of the eternally beautiful, the eternally good, and the eternally lovable. Love, therefore, became uh, a shadow symbol, a word symbol for the supreme passion of the human soul, the passion of St. Francis of Assisi, the passion of St. De Buenaventura and Santa Teresa, uh, the passion of those in whose spiritual experience there is this tremendous unfolding of absolute adoration, uh, for the infinite beauty in the root of existence. I think the Moslem, in many ways, worshipped beauty, or worshipped a God who walked in beauty. To him, uh, the beauty of existence uh, was of the greatest psychic appeal. Again, perhaps, because it represented a kind of world that he knew only in a fragmentary way one little rose growing in the desert by the side of some oasis. He saw this beauty flash but seldom to his eyes, and therefore it had great and sublime meaning for him. It became perhaps the eternal symbol of that which is most desired. Out of this came the strange lovesick language of the Persian poets in which it seemed as though they spent all their days and nights serenading some blessed damosel. But actually this whole strange pageantry, uh, this wonderful symbolism had to do only with the experience of this eternal recognition of the overwhelming beauty of the universe itself. The unattainable perfection of infinites before which every human being knelt in utter surrender. The pure experience of love itself, apart from any addiction to human frailty, the power to reach out and simply to love life, to reach into the unknown and find there the infinite loveliness of God. This moved these people moved them to produce some of the most glorious literature the world has ever known, a literature, however, which we have utterly failed to understand, a literature uh, which perhaps most of them never really understood, but which uh, shines with the strange light of this ecstasy of man's ever-seeking for reality. And under the mysterious symbol of inspiration, uh, this infinite longing for the light. The uh, mystic of Islam uh, used the symbol of the vine. To him, wine was the symbol of ecstasy, even as it was in the Bacchic rites of ancient Greece, and continued to carry the same essential meaning in the Eucharistic mysteries of Christianity. The mysterious power of wine, the wine of life, seemed to lead to a parallel that was very interesting. Man taking a little more wine than his, was his need, suddenly released from himself his true and essential nature. Wine was the remover of inhibitions. Wine made the tired old man young and glad again. Wine made the vicious man more vicious and hateful. Wine made the stupid lazy man more lazy and more stupid. 
Rome always brought from the individual something of himself. And this wine, in turn, was a symbol of the forgetfulness of mortal things. It caused the individual to enter into a strange fool's paradise, in which whatever he really wanted or whatever he really thought could be true at least for a little while, until, as Omar points out, finally this kindly, friendly vine turns like a monster and strangles those that use it. But it was like, in a way, the wine of ecstasy itself. And so we hear much of the Sufi and his wine jug. We hear that uh, for wine he sacrifices all other things. That uh, he turns from the glories of the world to the simple joys of the bottle. What he is telling us really is something entirely different. That he had discovered in the universe a mysterious agent, an agent of luminous energy. He had discovered the intoxication of self-forgetfulness. He had discovered that without touching any of the fruit of the vine, that he could be drunk with God. Now this was a, perhaps a rather crude way of saying a great thing. But we might remember that to the Muslim, uh, wine as we know it uh, was actually forbidden. Therefore, that what we read in these poetic, poetic works uh, should not be interpreted as literal. But this intoxication with life, imagine the man in the desert uh, seated beside his camel looking out into the night, looking out as men have looked from a thousand different mountainsides and valleys and forests and deserts and hills and the dawn of things. And suddenly, as, like, as in the case of Lao Tzu, on the side of the mountain in China, suddenly the whole universe opened up. Suddenly the mountains and the valleys and the skies seemed to split asunder, and everywhere was radiance. Everywhere was a tremendous light of insight. Suddenly the divine power itself seemed to descend and enfold mortality. Everywhere the eye of the mystic looked, there was only God. There was only light and truth. If he turned his ears uh, inwardly to listen, he heard only the strange mystic chanting of the spheres. Every sound was beautiful. Every odor was that of flowers and incense. If he reached out his fingers, he touched something softer and more wonderful than the most precious silks. Everything that touched his senses was transformed into an absolutely perfect thing, something so wonderful that in the presence of it he melted. He wept, strong men wept, simply because of the beauty of God. If this experience happened in these five distant places of the desert, then these men were said to be intoxicated. They were the God-intoxicated ones. Some said they were mad. But madness of this kind was in the keeping of Allah. And no man would dare to molest or injure a madman. They were the beloved of God. For in their madness they had remained with him, and their minds had never come to earth. This strange madness of the desert mystic which suddenly swept him into this ecstatic universe of light and beauty. This was the wine of ecstasy. It was light, it was life, it was the love of God flowing in space. A man became drunk with it. And in his intoxication, 
He had what perhaps the Westerner would call a mystical experience, for he was possessed by God. Yet when he was so possessed, he didn't see God. He did not actually hear the voice of God. No great miracles were performed before his wandering vision. The thing that heralded, marked the presence of God, the thing which made him know that God was there, was sheer beauty. Beauty that transcended every sensory faculty that he possessed. He was in the presence of absolute beauty. And this beauty was alive with infinite love. He was therefore standing in the sublimation of every instinct, every appetite, every perception and reflective power that he possessed. He was alone in space with this experience of being enfolded by the wonder of God. This was his intoxication. This was the wine of the point. Well, the wine was simply the, the mystical experience. Here in the West, we have some records or some accounts of this experience. Among the saints of Christendom, there is a beautiful description of a, an experience of this kind uh, by Havelock Ellis in his Dance of Life, an experience that occurred to him. But to the men of the desert, it would be different because they came from a different world and they had a different need within the, the empty psychic need within themselves. It was different. They could not have the experiences of a European saint or an Asiatic uh, yogi. Their experience had to be of the desert, of their land, of their way of life. So they had this strange sense as one poet said, that suddenly, truly, the desert blossomed as a rose. Suddenly the desert was beautiful. Truly it was the garden of Allah. And all of a sudden, all of its sorrows, its tragedies, and its bleached bones disappeared from that awareness. The desert itself was, a, was one great beauty. In old times also, there was another group of men who had the same kind of experiences. And these were the men who went down to the sea in ships. For in those days, ships were small and men were strong. And the storms were great upon the deep. But every man who loved the sea regarded it as a strange and lovely thing. To the sailor of old, the sea was more wonderful than any woman could possibly be. Its moods were as terrible as any strange passion that could move the earth. And yet these men who fought the sea loved it, and their one hope of ever all else was that when the end came, they would die at sea and their bodies would rest forever in the deep. And as these men had their mystical experience at night, watching the endless waves of the ocean, and found their great love in the ocean itself, so the men of the desert, watching the sand and the light shining on it, found their great love in the desert. And the desert became the universe and the desert became the abode of God. And the desert with all its moods were the moods of God. And uh, how else can we describe the strange experiences that these people had? Well, we also know that in the course of these strange ecstasies uh, that the uh, mystics of Islam gradually did reverse the polarity of their consciousness uh, so that uh, they were not quite sure which world was real. And as their mysticism became more intense, as their asceticism advanced, as it also did in other Asiatic nations, 
there was really an exchange of worlds, even while men lived. Here in the West, the world beyond is something we wait for with fear or hope after the termination of our mortal life. But to these meditating sages and seers, the other world was already an achieved reality. Uh, they had already wandered back and forth between the regions, even while they were still in mortal flesh. And not only were these symbols very real and important to them, but they discovered a microcosm within themselves. If it was true that the universe was the body of a great deity, as was taught by the Greeks and more or less accepted by the early Islamic scientists, so surely man fashioned in the image of this creator was also a universe. And man had within himself all of these strange mysteries that were seen at night in the desert, for man's body was a desert. And yet this body with which he had dwelt, outwardly apparently desert-like, subject to all the strange storms and terrors of darkness and of fear, within man was also another region, a region that could be found only by the individual who was able to disentangle his consciousness from the binding pressures of objectivity. Here was your yoga again. Here was the individual determining that he had two lives, just as nature in the desert had two lives. There was the outer life of man, man dwelling in a house with walls of mud and a roof of reeds or wood, man struggling every day to guard his herds against the ravages of his neighbors or of beasts man growing faint and tired and finding only a small consolation in the companionship of other mortals like himself. Man in the desert, seeing very few other human faces, alone in a strange, almost uninhabited world. And then yet this man, suddenly realizing, as the dervish of the Sufi in his musings, that he had his own inner life. He looked at his hands and they were toil worn. His face was wrinkled by the wind and sun, his body bent with years. But there was within him something ever young and ever new. Also within himself, he could have any kind of life he really wanted. Inside of him, there was a life beyond poverty, beyond sickness, beyond age, and beyond death. So the mystic decided uh, that within his own soul he could build the secret garden of his heart's desire. And the mystics always symbolized the quiet inner life as a beautiful garden like the garden of the troubadour within which it grew forever the rose of immortality. So by entering into your own life, if you so desire and are so willing, you can enter always and walk with beauty. You can find the secret garden of your own subjective existence. Here you will find all the flowers never fade. You will find that no weeds come into this garden unless you permit them to. You can enter into this garden as the seven sages of China retired to their bamboo grove. And here, you can do all the beautiful things and think all the beautiful thoughts and feel all the beautiful emotions that seem vain and foolish and audacious in the, middle, in the material world. But here you can sing songs of great beauty even though your physical voice cannot carry a tune. Here everything can be as you want it to be. Now in the West we are very afraid of these things. We are afraid that the individual will sink into a kind of imaginary world and there he will become a hopeless psychotic and never come out again. 
We believe that men can drown in their own subconscious or their own uh, psychic uh, dilemmas. Perhaps this is true if this inner world has been strangely and terribly contaminated. But the men of the desert were a simple people. Uh, they had very few great ambitions. Wealth was beyond an e even a hope. Success was only for those who were born to command. For the rest, life was the desert, the sheep, the little village, the mosque. There was nothing else. So these people, uh, while perhaps they were rather uh, savage or barbaric within, in their outer lives, were strangely childlike within themselves. They could go into themselves without finding complication, which we cannot do. They had been brought up always in a faith which they had held very close and sacred. They had kept the simple commands of the Koran as best they could. They had faith in Allah and his prophet, upon whose name be peace. Therefore, uh, these people were strangely simple in themselves. And when they went into themselves, they did not find deceit. They found rather a quiet place, untouched by great anxieties, or great selfishness. And in this quiet place, as in a small allotment of land, they could build a garden as they wished it to be. So they had the wall garden. It was walled because it was surrounded on every side by body. It was a secret garden because no one but themselves could ever enter it. Even if others were invited, they could not come in. Only their ghosts could enter their ghosts being their thought likenesses created by the master of the garden. In this secret garden, man was the master of the show, and around him the shadow forms that came and went. And here in this magic garden, the individual built his own paradise, the paradise of dreams, of great and noble hopes and aspirations. The mystic, the Sufi particularly, had the suspicion down inside of himself that perhaps this magic garden was the antechamber to paradise. Perhaps man building this secret garden of good in himself was building the region in which he must sometime live. Perhaps all of this mystery was psychological. That the inner life of man was really his world. And when he cast off this mortal flesh, his soul would go to the magic garden he had built and there abide in the beauty he had fashioned until the will of Allah called it forth to other labors. In whatever case it might be, uh, to the believer, this magic garden became very real. There is no doubt in the world that these people could invoke this mood at will. There is also no possible doubt that it was possible for them to revive it in a continuous pattern, as the points themselves so noted. So that every night when a man went to sleep, he could will himself to go back into his garden and continue his labors there. That he had an inner life of continuous internal reminiscence. Perhaps it started as daydreaming. Perhaps it started by the individual consciously fashioning this place by meditation, or as the Easterners say, by will and yoga. But after a time, this inner meditation became real. It became something that happened of itself. And little by little, this inner garden was built to greater and greater perfection. This probably is under, underneath the Chinese concept, which we find in the uh, doctrines of the uh, released or 
a spiritually regenerated being, the transcendent being of the Chinese classics, a being fashioned by man out of the virtues of himself, this being finally becoming the body for his own consciousness. In any event, uh, this region uh, of the psychic creativity of the mystic is recorded in many places and probably lies close to the source of the descriptions of visions uh, that we find all the way from ancient Egypt to Emanuel Swedenborg. These visions seem real. Andrew Jackson Davis, the seer of Poughkeepsie, the American mystic, psychic, describes the summer land which he actually visited in his own uh, psychic experiences. Here was a beautiful land of mountains and valleys and shrines and temples where everything was beautiful and everyone was good. He really believed that he saw these places. And many spiritualistic paintings depict in a rather vague way the semi-paradisical semi abode of the blessed. Many works on psychic phenomena also consist of messages supposedly coming from persons dwelling in these strange radiant vistas. The Sufi almost surely tells us the clue, or gives us the clue to the whole thing, the magic garden of his own believing. The mysterious visualization within himself which finally caused this vision to take substance. Here I think we come also very close to a problem involving modern psychology in the West. Man's subconscious here in the West is so heavily loaded with the formal worldly pressures that we push into it. We have made this material world so real that it obsesses our sleep. We have made it so complete in its domination over our lives that it dominates the inner as well as the outer part of man. This is its danger. This is the reason why we can have a psychotic. This is the reason why uh, the individual can become mentally and emotionally sick inside. This sickness is due to the tremendous power which he possesses to internalize external things, and at the same time to carry into this internalization all the unfulfilled ambitions and pressures and longings of his life. All of these, however, worldly. All of these binding the internal to the external. All of these making it seem to be necessary for man to succeed as a physical being in order to attain any degree of consolation of spirit. Spirit depends upon matter for its fulfillment in Western man. Spirit depends upon wealth, achievement, prestige, and status for its satisfaction. While this continues, of course, the individual will have not a quiet inner life, but a heavily conditioned one. The inner life of the average person is simply not suited for any form of tranquility. We go inside and we find chaos and confusion. We find no beautiful garden, but rather a terrible and horrible land of witchcraft and sorcery. In some way, the medieval experience of witchcraft which brought so many uh, generations of misery into European history with the persecution of poor, deluded souls. Uh, this uh, whole situation seems to have resulted from the fact that the Black Mass was celebrated in the heart of man himself, and that the Brocken from which the witches flew on their broomsticks was part also of a legendary atmosphere that arose in the subconscious of mortal man. So there was some reason why, when the Western man relaxed, he found himself in purgatory, and the Eastern man, in his relaxation, finding himself in paradise. Neither one really tried to build, by the common processes that we know, a conditioned existence. 
Uh, the Eastern man did not realize that he was trying to create a virtuous life, and certainly the Western man was not aware uh, that he was attempting to uh, integrate his own vices into an overwhelming obsession. These were not the thoughts. They were conditions of existence. The man of the desert uh, did not have the pressures. Therefore, he did not create the psychotic tensions. He had a different attitude toward life. He believed in God. He really, sincerely, and devoutly believed. And being of simple nature, even his violences were simple. And by degrees, he realized that his greatest achievement was to transmute violence, that his earthly passions could become almost divine compassions. So he sort of changed the level of his reactions, seeking to use his sentiments and his most amorous inclinations uh, to court eternal beauties. Western man went the opposite way. He commercialized his arts. He prosecuted and persecuted his mystics. He did most of the things that would naturally be against the mystic life. And today he finds himself without this mystic life. And wherever his ways are spread upon the world, other nations lose their mystic overtones also and begin to develop the same ailments and pressures that afflict Western humanity. The Sufi uh, lived in the borderland between great empires. He realized that there was a vast European structure uh, rising from the decline and fall of Rome, that the great Byzantine Empire was close upon him that there was a rise of the Huns and the Goths and the Visigoths. He also knew something of the distant shadowing wisdom of India and the great uh, luxury of Chinese civilization. Between these, as in a valley between two great ranges of mountains, he was in a middle distance between extremes. And in this middle distance, he remained wonderfully himself and became capable of the quiet cultivation of his own nature. Perhaps some part of it was influenced by his convictions or his determinations. Perhaps if he had let go entirely, he might have fallen into one of the psychotic problems that we now know. But this he did not do, apparently. For convinced always of the religious equation, he only demanded or permitted beauty to be fashioned in his vision. When he contemplated, and we know from the poets, that while he was aware of the troubles of his times, in his contemplations he passed over these troubles lightly. His real purpose always was to find uh, a great uh, beauty, a great security, a great exhilaration of spirit. He did not look inside of himself to become a critic, nor did he actually look inside of himself to become a scholar. Mysticism was not to produce formal scholarship, nor great technical advancements in sciences. Mysticism was to produce the motivations by which perhaps other men with other faculties uh, could apply uh, skill uh, to insight and vision. So actually, in this mystical thinking, we have these poets, these dreamers, uh, actually giving us the skeletal structure of an enduring civilization. Actually, civilizations are created by poets and buried by philosophers. So each in his own way is essential poetry to give beauty and wings to youth, philosophy to give patience to age. These are the ways of life, and they were the ways of the desert people. They had their own scholars and their wise men and the priests that could interpret the sacred writings and the teachers of their young, 
But they also had the great free world of inner movement, of inner symbolism, of inner beauty within themselves. Uh, the final uh, development of this concept, as far as generalities are concerned, seems to have been the final achievement of union. Uh, this is again our concept of yoga, for the word means union. But these mystics uh, sought to be one forever with the beloved. They wished to uh, give all of themselves, uh, to hold nothing back, uh, to cease to exist in the beloved. We know they are talking of Vedanta, we know they are talking of mysteries, even while perhaps in our own rather superficial way we would like to think that they are speaking merely of sensory gratifications. Actually, to be lost forever in the Beloved was the great goal of Dante and uh, Petrarch and the other great troubadours of Europe. It was to give one's life utterly by the code of chivalry. And out of this came the orders of knight errantry in Europe, where the great, uh, great proof of chivalry was the willingness to die utterly for the preservation of honor, beauty, and virtue. So in the individual, this code of chivalry, the Oriental or Japanese code of Bushido, uh, became the code of the mystic, became the code of the dervish and the Sufi. He wished to die for truth, or perhaps more correctly, to die into truth. He knew, as the yoga teaches, that as long as the self remains, truth cannot be perfect. As long as man remains man, he cannot know God in the fullness of his knowing. For in the final union of all these uh, separated and dissonant parts, nothing remains except God. Man vanishes, creation vanishes. Only the eternal love wisdom of deity remains. So this was to die for the beloved, to cease completely in this strange sense which suggests the Eastern Nirvana. There has been a great deal of talk, a great deal of thought as to the meaning of Nirvana in Buddhism. Whether it meant the merely the dying out of the fires of lust and selfishness and greed, or whether Nirvana represented truly and utterly the complete and utter end of self. And the Buddhists themselves divided their thinking into two groups on this. One that Nirvana was indeed the individual ceasing completely as a living sacrifice to truth. For as long as man existed, error existed. As long as the individual was himself, evil must continue in the world. For man cannot be completely good. And if he appears to be becoming better, it is not because he is increasing in virtue, but because eternal and inevitable virtue itself is increasing in him. The other school of thought is uh, that there is a kind of way in which man uh, can give up being bad by becoming wholly good in himself, that there is this other possible way. And the only way that he can become wholly good or as nearly completely good as possible is that he shall become absolutely selfless, that he shall live only for the glory of truth, that he shall exist in this world only to teach, to save, to preserve, to enlighten. This was the holy destinies of the Bodhisattvas, that they should come into embodiment for one purpose only, the salvation of man. Self was dead in them. All human purpose was dead in them. They walked in the bodies of men. 
but they lived in the Spirit of God. These totally redeemed ones, who appeared to be men, but were really truth walking the earth, uh, these were also the mysterious uh, green vested saints of Islam. These were the Ahats. These were the purified ones who could perform miracles by a natural course of things, for their own existence was a miracle. They were the ones who had all the available energies of nature at their disposal, yet they used no energy but truth, taught no doctrine but law, practiced no miracle but love. And by this strange token, by this wonderful mysticism, they created the, the concept of a positive identity with deity. Uh, that these were no longer persons, but that they had provided channels so that in the perfected ones, truth was made flesh and dwelt among us that these perfected ones were no longer real persons. They were God. And those who look, looked into the faces of these perfected ones saw not the faces of men, but the face of God. And whoever had seen this, the one who was a son of God, had seen the Father. For the Father was in the Son, and the Son was in the Father. They dwelt together in a strange a dynamic relationship. Uh, this was part of the Eastern tradition that I think finally moved towards Islam. For among the Muslims, we do not find the strange passivity of Southern Buddhism with its doctrine of extinction. We find, rather, uh, the experience of God being a, a release into a, an eternal sufficiency. That these uh, saints in their green robes uh, disappeared from among men like the higher orders of the dervishes. <coughs> uh, they were seen no more by mortals, but those who uh, saw visions in the deserts could see them. And sometimes they would appear in the oasis, far from any other uh, mortal being to comfort a tired traveler or bring aid to those sick and dying. Then they would fade away again, disappearing into their realm of stars. The Muslim believed in these saints and believed in them completely. And he believed that actually they were persons who had gradually come to change the polarity of their lives so that the real abode in which they dwelt was the magic garden they had fashioned with their hearts. Having completed this garden, they moved into it. They closed the door behind them, like the Zen monk who walked into his painting and disappeared. They had fashioned a magnificent internal life and retired into that internal life, according to legend, taking even the body with them. <coughs> In any event, they disappeared. They disappeared into a world of creative thought, a world of universal beauty, a world of transcendent light. And here in their magic gardens, uh, they kept the ancient records, they wrote the poems, they inspired mortals. They lived in a paradise between heaven and earth, <coughs> a paradise like Amitabha's wondrous world. And uh, in the Sufi and Dervish mysticism, uh, there were these regions also. And the first step was into the, into the temple, into the university in this world, uh, where studying with the bearded sages and scholars, the young disciple perfected his knowledge of those arts and mysteries which belong to the world of spirit. And so finally it happened that the disciple became one with his teacher. After he had attained this, he entered into the state of meditation and transferred his alliance and allegiance from an earthly teacher to the Prophet Muhammad himself. And here he meditated, dreamed, listened, 
and sat reverently at the feet of the image which he himself had fashioned. Sensing the presence of Muhammad in the very air about him, he finally became one with his prophet. And when he had united himself with the prophet, then he chose the farther goal. He, he experienced the mystery within himself of standing in the presence of Allah, the great veiled presence of the eternal God. And here he also meditated and prayed, and he listened to the eternal instruction of the eternal Father, until at last he became one with God. These were his three steps. These were the mysterious regions through which he passed. From earth he moved to paradise, and from paradise to eternity. Uh, these were his dreams, these were his goals. Perhaps he was a very wise man, perhaps a very confused one. We do not know. But one thing we do realize is that out of the strange legendary and lore of these peoples have come some of the most beautiful thoughts we have ever had in this world. Thoughts of such exquisite refinement, the thoughts so elevating in spirit, that they are like the mysterious uh, galandalios of music, like the strange grace notes of Bach. They make a tired world seem strangely rich and warm with their beauty. And just as the wonderful arabesques upon their mosques, the intricate designs of inlaid semi-precious stones in white marble, are among the treasures of the world, so this strange, subtle pageantry and artistry of their creative insight, painted pictures in words, painted pictures in thoughts, made magnificent panoramas and spectacles, uh, which no other nation ever apparently dared to fashion in the same way. They had the abandon of a great artist. They had the complete freedom of an emancipated soul using his brush and palette for the revelation of his deepest convictions. And that which he finished in this strange artistry uh, was truly mystical, truly sacred in its substance. And uh, we recognize it today. We recognize something of his purpose underneath all of the appearances of things, simply because good from good comes. And all the beauty of the Near Eastern wisdom can only tell of the strange, deep beauty of the mystics themselves. The mystics were the true priests of Islam. The mystics are the ones who really sensed what happened to Muhammad in the dark nights on Mount Hira. They realized the strange torture of the Prophet's soul. They realized the agony he went through in his own inner seeking for the lost faith of his fathers. The mystics found his soul and upon the inner teaching of his own uh, great sadness of spirit, the mysterious experience, the mystical experience of the prophet, when he stood beside the body of his infant son, Ibrahim, knowing the child was dead, and fought with himself for faith in Allah against the bereavements of a heartbroken father. And how this struggle led finally to greater and greater dedication. How little by little this man found his union with his God. And the Muslim mystic, instead of copying his teaching from the characters of the Quran, instead of tracing with his fingers the words of the prophet, sought to know in his heart the agonies of a father, sought to know with his spirit uh, the wonders taking place in the heart of a man who did not believe that he was God, who did not believe that any strange, mysterious power actually dominated his life, who had to make the decisions of a human being, who had to fight each day to keep his own faith, and having won this great battle with himself, 
finally came victoriously to the first great achievement of the Hezira, and finally to the pilgrimage of Mecca, where standing in the midst of his people, the Prophet revealed the faith of Islam. Here the mystic sees not the splendor of the law. The mystic sees the greatness of a soul weeping over the body of his dead. This is the difference, and out of this difference came the strange, quiet wisdom of the desert, and also this great search for the supreme love, for the supreme understanding that makes it possible for man to know that everything that he has in his soul, that Allah is great, that there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. This was the wisdom of the desert, but in the hearts of men, not in the books of the law. Well, next week we will continue this discussion of the Persian mystics. Thank you very much.